Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon Listeners. Welcome, everybody. It's time again for another uh, Word Balloon Live conversation. Happy Free Comic Book Day. We should start off and say that. And a uh, great subject for uh, today being Free Comic Book Day. We are taking a look at a great podcast that uh, was originally available and probably still is on XM and Sirius, but now is available as a podcast wherever you get podcasts. Comic-Con begins. It's a great deep dive in the history of uh, San Diego Comic-Con and nerd culture, but in a lot of ways explains where we are today and where we came from originally so first of all uh, i'm happy to welcome uh matthew clickstein who's been on war balloon before a fine comic book writer and uh geek genre author himself good to see you matthew hi john thanks for having me on again absolutely and uh first time talking to uh, roger friedman who one of the uh, original organizers of comic-con which is just amazing and uh going back to the beginning man and one of the is it uh First fans, is that a fair uh, classification, Roger? Well, yeah, actually, first fandom, and, and but first of all, thanks for having me on board here, John. Yeah, actually, first fandom goes back even further to the first of all conventions, which was the World Science Fiction Convention in 1939. Um, so, and, and, and in fact, one of the original brains behind Comic-Con, Ken Kruger, was at Worldcon 1 in 1939. So he counts as a first fan. So, so we're maybe... Um, um, that maybe the seventh wave or something like that. We, we've gone um, through um, uh, not any number of infinite crises before you got to our group of first fans, if you will. Well, as a podcaster, I always, uh, because I started podcasting in 2005, I always put things in astronaut terms. Okay. And I always say that I was kind of a Mercury astronaut starting in that first year of podcasting. And uh, I mean, I understand there's a 30 year uh, leap from that uh, 1939 science fiction uh, uh, thing that also had people like Forrest Ackerman and Julie Schwartz attending that show. Uh, but uh, yeah, man, I mean, I would say for, for purely comic cons, maybe that, uh, yeah, you're, you're in that first generation and everything. And God, what a seriously, man, both of you, congratulations. Cause Matthew uh, co-wrote and directed uh, and co-produced the, the podcast and obviously uh, your contributions, Roger, both as an interview guest, but I'm sure in terms of uh, just your own experiences and stuff, what an incredible uh, podcast, truly, guys. I, I really love it. It is such a great deep dive, granular look at exactly uh, how San Diego Comic-Con was formed. And um, really starting at the beginning, shame on me for not putting two and two together, but um I, I love the fact that it was really an out, outgrowth of the underground comic book movement of the period. And Roger, you could speak to that, obviously. 
Sure. Yeah. So certainly, all that was happening at the same time. Um, I, I, I think actually, uh, in terms of the very beginnings of Comic Con in 1970, that um, certainly there were a number of us who were reading undergrounds at that time. It's I would not go as far to say there was a large part of what Comic Con was about, uh, but certainly as time went by and as the underground movement evolved. Uh, it became a larger and larger part of Comic-Con. And it, it's interesting to point out as well, and, the, and Matthew uh, points this out in the, in the podcast as well, is that even at the beginning, because people complain that, oh, Comic-Con isn't all about comics anymore, there's all this movie stuff, there's all this science fiction stuff, but in fact, all three of those aspects were part of the original Comic-Con. And so yeah, our first science fiction guest was the science fiction writer A.E. Van Vogt. So, so, so the fact that... Um, it was called Comic Con even then. What well, was then as now really a misnomer? It really involves stuff across the, the whole uh, the whole geek spectrum, as it were. Speak to that, Matthew, if you would. Yeah, you know, um, as you've heard in the series there, John, and and anyone else who's checked out Comic Con Begins or knows about the history of Comic Con uh, on a more intimate level, as obviously Roger does. Uh, so much of this also came. Uh, from Shell Dorf's involvement with the Detroit Fanfare. And it was known as the Triple Fanfare because it was not just comics, but it was also movies and animation. And certainly that was a big part of where Comic-Con was coming from at that time, at the very earliest stages. Um, and they had, and, and as Roger was saying, you know, there was science fiction and so forth. But uh, as we learned from talking to so many people about Comic-Con in those early days, it was also magic. It was yo-yoing. It was kung fu movies. And you have to remember, Star Trek had its own space there as early as 1973. They had Frank Capra come in 1974, I think it was. I mean, he has nothing to do with comic books at all. And then by 75, you already have Chuck Norris coming and talking about Bruce Lee. So, you know, Roger's 100% right. And that was something that definitely came up a lot, especially when we're talking about the later years where there was this kind of ubiquitous complaint of, oh, Comic-Con's not about comic books anymore. Well, it really never, ever was. Um, and if anything, it was always about at least comics and science fiction. And just to kind of wrap that up a little bit, we were even struggling with the title of the series from the very beginning, because as you just said yourself, John, I personally see Roger and a lot of his generation as kind of quote unquote first geeks, call it a marketing or a branding term, if you will. Obviously, there was H.P. Lovecraft and people like H.G. Wells and Ken Kruger and Forry Ackerman and the 39 crowd at Worldcon. But, you know, in a way, you can say that these guys, Roger and his friends who were creating Comic-Con, were the first ones who were really calling themselves, you know, fans, geeks, nerds, whatever you might want to call it. Some of them didn't, but a lot of them did. So I think that in a lot of ways, they were first generation. We were thinking originally of calling the series first geeks, both because of that, what I just said, but also because we want to make it clear, and, and we want, I want to make it clear now, it's not just about San Diego Comic-Con, it's really about the community that San Diego Comic-Con helped to foster all of the different conventions all over the country and world, and really all of the different kind of niche tribes of different geek communities, Star Trek and so forth, all the way up to now with Harry Potter and Twilight and the comic book movies and so forth, so that was a lot of what we wanted to do with the series, was tell about all these different little niche communities that came together every year for Comic-Con and these other conventions. That's really what it's about. Understood. And Roger, um, the great thing is, and again, it's uh, made very clear, yeah, especially at the beginning, you guys were, with the exception of Sheldorf, who was a man in his 30s when uh, he, he met your clubs, but you guys were high school clubs that were thinking about doing this. And truly, man, that's that's just fantastic. And 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 we forget because of the size of Comic Con, and it really is a global experience today. Uh, that it really did start from very modest beginnings of a bunch of high school kids going, "Hey, we like this stuff. Why don't we get together and and do something bigger than just you know meeting meeting uh, above shell store or uh, forgive me if I'm misremembering whose specifics are. And please describe." whose store you were meeting above and what their business was, because I think that's fantastic sure. as well. Yeah, so, so we were actually meeting in Ken Kruger's uh, bookstore um, out there on, on, the, on, on the ocean shore in San Diego. 
and uh, sort of all get together uh, on a, I actually forget what the interval was between meetings, um, but, and it was, it was a general bookstore. Also, there was the back, the one room I, I, I will, I never went into, but that was the adult section. So it was one of those kind of bookstores as well. Probably paid the bills. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. As Ken Krug pointed out, that, that was, that part of the bookstore is what actually paid the bills. Oh, there's no doubt. Absolutely. Was it a used bookstore or was it current? Uh, uh both. Okay. Yeah, really sure. Yeah, exactly. Sure. And, and the name of our group, uh, was one that in retrospect, I wish we would have actually given that name to the con as a whole. Because today, Comic-Con is kind of generic. Um, but the original name uh, for, for the, at least the club of which I was part, the one that met at Ken Kruger's, was the Headquarters for All Fan Activity in San Diego, which is pronounced half-assed. <laughs> And so, so had had they stuck with that name, you would have. Oh, well, they didn't have half-assed this year, but I went to half-assed at home. And so, <laughs> outstanding, man. And truly, just I mean, you guys, you know, you go back to the beginning where this thing was formed and all the different uh, input of what it should be, and so many fantastic stories. Uh, as I was telling Roger off off the air. My first uh, Comic Con was uh, San Diego spe specifically was 2006, and thank God I went when I did because uh, I know in my first couple years I got to meet Ray Harryhausen and Ray Bradbury, which was like beyond exciting. I'm so glad that George Clayton Johnson was as important of a figure uh, in Comic Con's formative years. And for people who don't recognize the name of George Clayton Johnson, the guy who co-wrote uh, Logan's Run wrote the first uh, aired episode of, uh, of Star Trek, The Man Trap, and uh, great episodes of The Twilight Zone. He wrote Ocean's Eleven, the original story that became Ocean's Eleven, the Rat Pack version of the story. Um, and I, and I, I know I met him. I forget what, like, yeah, I think it was sadly, it might have been his last year, but I'm so glad I met him. And a good friend of mine, another cartoonist and writer, um, Andy Parks. I'm like, Andy, George Clinton Johnson is like finishing a panel right now. We got to go meet him. And he ran up with me and stuff, and I took a picture of uh, Andy and George, and he was so terrific. And this was only, you know, in, within the last 10 years or so. And it was great, and he goes, oh, thanks, boys. It's nice of you to remember me. And we're both, like, in our 40s. Yeah, thanks, boys. And we're like, this is awesome, man. I mean, it's George Clayton Johnson. So, and again, you get so granular about all of their involvement in Comic-Con, and there's fun stories. And listen, uh, we all forget, or maybe um, we're so used to being – labeled as nerds it's like hey guess what i mean yeah these were guys that were into you all were into comic con you know comics and sci-fi and classic movies but you know you were part of that great late 60s early 70s rock and roll generation and stuff and uh there was a lot of hip stuff going on over there as far as i'm concerned as well as uh the love of genre fiction yeah, you know, it's it's something that that was really astonishing to myself and my team. I have to uh, call out the members. We were a very small, scrappy team. We kind of had to be uh, doing all of this remotely during COVID. I mean, this really is what we did over the last year, year and a half. Um, our executive producer over at Sirius was Rob Schulte, an old friend of mine that I'd worked with on a few other projects. Uh, Christopher Tyler, who was an incredible producer and also helped with the writing and editing, as did Rob, um, our, our mixing genius. Uh, Jim Billadu, and as you said yourself a little earlier, John, the guy did the music for us, an old friend of mine also, Max DiVincenzo of Fox Tracks. Uh, you know, one of the things that we were learning as we were going through everything, and, and I had a sense of this already, but just the deepness of, you know, one thing I would tell people about what you just said is, you, know, you have to remember that you're getting the comic books a lot of times from head shops. You know, you think about San Francisco or, or the undergrounds or whatever it might be in the 60s and early 70s, and you would go and, and get your, you know, your, your, your water pipe or whatever it might be, your rolling papers. You'd get your copy of Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers, your Crumb Comics or Zap or whatever. Absolutely. When, when I've talked with people about it, especially people who are around kind of during that time, like my parents, I hate to say it, or whomever. And I talk about that intersection. They go, yeah, that actually does make a lot of sense because there was such a crossover there. And in fact, one of the many things that I did while I was researching for this project was that I actually got the omnibus of the Fabulous Furry Freak Brothers. And I was talking to people, Roger, I might have even discussed this with you at one point when we were talking, but I kept saying, you know, what's amazing is in the in the comics from the 
early 70s. They're, they're doing drugs. They're having sex. They're running around. They're going to protests. And they're reading and talking about comic books in the comic. And I just started really putting it together like that was really a part of the counterculture, that hippie culture. And when I started going back and forth and people like Abby Hoffman even and some of the other Chicago people in 68 and all these other folks, they talk about and reference Superman and Captain America. You got Donovan singing about that kind of Such stuff. Superman, absolutely. Really, man. Really, you start to see all of these connections and it just makes a lot of sense that there would be that intersection between the, the kids of the 50s and 60s and that comics and yes, even the sci-fi scene, because that was what was blowing up the minds of a lot of these people, especially people like Roger, who indeed, you know, he could talk about it better than I, goes on to become a physics professor and was very inspired by the moon landing, but also Ray Bradbury and, you know, Sturgeon and all of these other Robert Heinlein and whatnot. It all comes together about expanding one's mind. And, you know, you throw in some Hunter S. Thompson in there and those kinds of folks, and boom, <laughs> you've got Comic-Con. I mean, it just makes a lot of sense when you start thinking about it in those terms of the context of the time. And that was a lot of what we really wanted to get at and talk about and do was to really show what was going on in the atmosphere of these people that were breathing the air and were creating this thing so that it wasn't just about the comic convention, but about the community and the people and the times that they were in. Anyone who's interested in any of this that hasn't heard the show yet, I mean, we focus an entire episode, episode two, on this. A few people even said, hey, there wasn't really that much about Comic-Con in episode two. And it's like, exactly. It was about the time period, Vietnam and Nixon and what was going on with technology and the moon landing. And David Bowie is suddenly combining science fiction and rock and roll and what was going on with Woodstock and Manson and everything else. That was a part of what was happening at that time. And we wanted to dedicate an entire episode to it because we felt it was that important to discuss what we're talking about right now. Yeah, comment about it, Roger, as someone that really was experiencing that stuff. I was born in 64, so and thankfully had very cool parents that weren't at the head shops, but were smart enough to really make sure as a four-year-old, I understood what was happening with the moon landing. And like, all right, you know the moon, uh-huh. You see those guys on the screen in the helmets? Yeah. Okay, they're on the moon right now. And I mean, remember it vividly. So as someone that was a teenager during this period tell me tell me what was that like i mean again we get it in the podcast but give me your experience sure. yeah and, and as matthew said all these things were going on simultaneously and and certainly in my mind now and in my mind then as well um it really was all sort of a seamless whole yes there was all this dr very dramatic stuff happening in technology it's remarkable in fact that the uh we were, we were all kind of prepared for the moon landing by uh thanks to stanley kubrick and arthur clark with uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, which came out the year before. Um, and uh, so there's that going on. Uh, obviously, all the all the crazy political stuff that's happening at the same time as well. And the fact that, as you've already alluded to, you know, comic books were were definitely part of the culture. Not to the extent they are today, but certainly the extent that you know, Donovan could do a song called Sunshine Superman, and I knew that what that was about. Um, there was uh, the, the fact that you could have a, a character named Captain America um, in, in Easy Rider. In Easy Rider, right. Rider, exactly. So, and people would know what that was about. Uh, the fact that Marvel comics were as popular as they were on college campuses as that at that time. So we were kind of well primed for all these things to be happening simultaneously. And again, in our mind, there was sort of it was all merged together. It wasn't like Oh, I'm. I just read Marvel, or or I just read DC, or my God, I need help. I only read Charlton, or something like that. You know, we 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 were we, uh, we, we, were, uh, uh, we, we were reading everything, sure. and likewise, and likewise uh, today, where there's so much, for instance, science fiction product available on TV, streaming, yes. and what have you, and you really have to do triage to decide what you're going to watch. Well, then we would just watch everything, and and some of it was was complete crap. Some of it was little better crap. And then there was, okay, this stuff's pretty decent, but we'd watch all of it because that's all there was. And, and we sort of appreciated all that stuff. We were reading Lovecraft, we were reading Bradbury, we were reading Wells and Vern Doc and Smith. all of that. And yeah. so, yeah, Doc Smith um, and, um, and on all of this. And so, so all of this sort of was merged together. And, and, and we love comic books and we love comic strips as well. 
And I hear, so, yeah. Yeah. So, so, so just to finish, uh, I, I would just say that all of that was really an integrated whole. And if you, because there was in a way so little content compared to today, it was easy to keep track of everything. Matthew, how many people did uh, you, you guys end up interviewing for the, well, the six, by the way, six up, ep- seven up. Ep- well, there's the teaser, but six episodes, most of them are around an hour. Uh, the first episode is almost 90 minutes long. So th- again, this is a very granular, deep dive in this subject. Oh, yeah. And I urge people to listen to every chapter <laughs> because really the level of detail and uh, people reminiscing about the experiences, they experienced it and stuff is just great. How many people did you talk to? In the end, we probably talked to about 50 people. Uh, we spoke to about 30, a little more than 30 of some of the original folks who were there in the very beginning, like Roger and a few of his friends. Um, you know, we wanted to make sure to get everybody, Mike Towery and Barry Alfonso and Scott Shaw, uh, Brink Stevens, who was there in the very beginning and has also had an amazing career thereafter. A lot of people probably know her from her Screen Queen films. And, and she was also married to Dave Stevens at one point. And Absolutely. Of Rocketeer fame and so forth. And a number of these other folks that we spoke with, Greg Bear and, and others, um, obviously Jackie Estrada, we had to get her in there. I really, when I work on projects like this and I've done other projects, the Nickelodeon book and the Simpsons book and others, this is sort of what I do. I, I get a very fandom esque mentality about it. I want to collect them all. And I really worked hard to make sure we got everybody. Um, and you know, a lot of these people I was already familiar with. I mean, some of them have become, you know, very famous in their own right, not only for the work they've done, but for their own histories of Comic-Con like Jackie or Maggie Thompson or Trina Robbins, or certainly Mark Evanier. I Mark mean, Evanier. We're, you know, we can't do it without Mark. I mean, we just, you got to have Mark Evanier and some of this because we, not only did we want all those stories, but we really wanted there to be a signal to the community. Like this is the one. You know, there have been other articles and books and documentaries that deal with different aspects of Comic-Con, but no one really had the opportunity to go through and get everybody involved and have them tell the story. And for those also who haven't heard Comic-Con yet, uh, Comic-Con Begins yet, it's important to note, like, we really wanted to have that oral history quality. So it's almost more in some ways like a fever dream or collage where instead of hearing, you know, different interviews all together, we really cut it all together. And as you said, John, earlier, we had some amazing archival material, stuff from the 70 con, the 75 con. San Diego State University was really generous in giving us material. KPBS, the radio station there in San Diego, gave us some stuff. Uh, We were, you know, call it morbid or whatever you want to call it, we were able to bring in the disembodied voice of some people who had passed away, like Richard Alf and Shel Dorf and Ken Kruger, uh, we were able to speak with Gus Kruger, Ken's son, and Ken sent me some very nice, or I'm sorry, Gus sent me some very nice emails saying just how much he liked the series, but also that it really, he was tearing up at hearing his father's voice on this series. And for many people like Gus and certain others, it was really important for them to hear some of these people not only be name dropped, like Richard Alf and others who haven't always gotten a lot of credit for what they did, but to literally hear their voices and to be part of this. And we really wanted that to be a major element there, along with some of that archival material. And of course, for good measure and, and all that good marketing stuff, we were able to nab a few uh, kind of uber geeky uh, celebrities as well. The Russo brothers, Kevin Smith, Neil Gaiman, Frank Miller, uh, Bruce Campbell, who was a lot of fun. Scott Ackerman, who turned out to be a huge fanboy. I mean, we didn't want to take up too much of his time. He's running so many different things. When we were trying to wrap it up, he asked if he can keep going. And we said, yes, you may. And he kept talking. I mean, we we wanted to give him a shot to like, okay, I guess we got to go. And he, Can I keep talking? Sure, Scott. And he gave us some incredible material. He'd been going to the con since he was a kid in 1985. So, you know, there were some surprises like that along with, you know, I, I will admit, like a lot of people would be, I was a little nervous talking to Frank Miller. You, you've heard all the stories. You've read all the stories. You know, I was a little nervous. But you know what? He was a, a real sweetheart. You know, I guess, I don't know, whatever you want to call it over the years or something. But so it was just fun talking to all these people and to hear their experiences, not only at the con and about helping with the con in different ways, but as we said, also just their becoming fans they're geeking out over it. One of my favorite stories, which we really focused a lot on this as well, was hearing Kevin Smith talk about how, you know, he was at a con one year, a few years ago, 
got to talk to Stan Lee, got to meet a few other people. And Jason Mews turns to him at one point and says, you know, wouldn't it be great to go back 20 years to when we were kids and say, hey, not only are we going to go to Comic-Con and be guests there, but we're going to go so often we'll get to hang out with Stan Lee and all these other people. And Kevin said, that is cool. So it was great to hear people like that or Neil Gaiman or certain others say, you know, I was going there when I was still just a fan. Now I'm going there where I get mobbed by crowds. And that experience for so many of these people was really cool to kind of track over the course. It's why we did a six part series. We really wanted to track the entire trajectory of not only the con, but the stories of all these different people like Roger and Shell and Ken and Kevin Smith and Neil Gaiman and Scott Ackerman and everyone else, because it was such a part of their lives. And it's 50 years, you know, plus all the prehistory stuff that we snuck in there from episode one. Absolutely. And, I, you know, it's funny you mentioned uh, Frank Miller. I've been very fortunate and, and Word Balloon's growth had a lot to do with my uh, being able to go to San Diego early and then subsequently moderating uh, many panels over the years with Bill Sienkiewicz and Brian Bendis and John Hickman and Catherine and Stuart Immerman, among others, Mike, uh, uh, damn it, now I'm a, a shame on me. I'm, I'm blanking on uh, which Mike, one of our Chicago Mikes, uh, uh, but, but it doesn't matter. But you mentioned uh, Frank Miller. So it's my second year, 2007. And I really went on a low budget and I only had so many business cards. And right after the Eisner Awards, as everyone spills out and it's just hanging out in uh, the uh, the lobby area before you enter the ballroom where the Eisners happen, everybody's hanging out. And um, I go up to Frank Miller and I'm like, hey, I, I you know, 2007. I, as I always say, I always quote George Burns at the time, you know, there were we were all in the top 10 for comic book podcasts. There were only eight of us doing it. <laughs> so I, uh, so I approached Frank Miller and I'm like, Hey, I'm doing a podcast. would love to have you on. He's like, sure. Give me a business card. And I had just run out of, and I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm out of cards. And he goes and walks away. <laughs> and I love it. I love the story. And I, I am sure that the stars will align and I eventually <laughs> will have Frank on the show. And I've had many other wonderful people from Walt Simonson to Dave Gibbons yeah. uh, and the like, you know, since then on Word Balloon. It'll happen. It's okay. I'm a patient man. And enough of my friends are friends with Frank that I, I'll, I'll I'll find the reason to get him on eventually. But regardless, it's like, yeah, it's stuff like that. And that's the great thing. And you hear these kinds of anecdotes. And, and like you mentioned, Kevin Smith and Neil Gaiman. And um, you do, you get this great sense of how the show changed over the years as well. And Roger, um, you know, so so being one of these founding members that started the show, when did you stop going every year? How long how long of a stretch from the beginning were you going? Right. Um, well, you know, I went to the first mini con in 1974, the first real con. Uh, then I went to the um, I actually missed the 71 con because I, okay. I was in Europe that summer do, doing oh, wow. a college <laughs> student in Europe thing. Um but then did 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78. Um, missed a couple of years and then I came back in the 80s for a couple. And then didn't actually did not have the opportunity to come back until 09. Wow. And, and also in 2010, where I noticed, yeah, it got a little bigger somehow. Um, <laughs> and, and and then for a while there, I couldn't even get tickets. Uh, but then, it, but then in 2019, I, I was happy enough that they finally gave me the golden ticket, which means you can now come back whenever you want for free. Oh, that's wonderful! Congrats! Yeah. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. We really do that in case anyone thinks he's kidding. Yeah, a few other people told us about it. That was something we didn't have time to talk about in the series, but yeah, there is an actual Willy Wonka golden ticket apparently that goes to folks like Roger, deservedly yeah. so. Absolutely, 100 percent, man. And and that's the thing. I would definitely say that you founding members have have you know achieved that right. Uh, Brink Steven, is it Brink or Brinky? I never know how to proper pronounce Brink. her name. Brink Stevens. Some, some, some people call her Brinky, like Jim Valentino, but I think that's okay. Name. <laughs> well, she's the narrator, and again, one of those OG, you know, fans that was there right from the beginning. And her story from uh, being one of these one of these kids that was involved to uh, winning the cause uh, the costume contest as uh, Vampirella, and and people can see uh, pictures of. I mean, her screen queen career is well documented as well on as far as photos online but it's great to see these old pictures of her too doing vampirella and the various characters that she did and as you say of course well when she was uh with david dave stevens over the years she's a perfect narrator and uh again as as like an, an eyewitness i mean that's i'm a massive fan and thank god uh as we all get older 
that so many of you that were part of this from the beginning are still with us to tell the story firsthand because nothing frustrates me more than uh, secondhand accounts of the 20th century and they get shit wrong. Yeah. And it really is annoying. And it's like, uh, I'm sorry, there are people alive that will set you straight. Why aren't you talking to them? And sadly, a lot of that happens in the comic book realm. And I'm living in the glass house and sometimes I get things wrong. I try my best to research, but clearly Matthew and company did a great job of getting the right people to talk. And uh, it's, it's the story of Comic-Con and nerd fandom. I would say warts and all. Uh, there's one particular episode that you guys oh, yeah. focus on Shell Dorf, who, on the one hand, a big part of the founding of, of Comic Con, but on another hand, kind of a, a guy that uh, you know uh, had his issues with the others who organized the show. Yeah, obviously we we knew we'd been developing this for a very long time, even before we really got started. Uh, once again, you know, frankly, COVID and lockdown uh, really complicated things. We were already starting to develop this right before that happened. And I personally had been doing a lot of research and so forth. This was originally going to be uh, like one of my oral history books for like a Penguin Random House or something. Then it was going to become an audiobook original. We talked a little bit about, you know, straight up video documentary, of course. Uh, but when COVID and everything started happening, we really just had to shift gears. And by then, John, I had already been talking with people like Roger and our fantastic historical consultant, Wendy All, who was really the person who helped me connect with everybody and kind of talked with them and said, talk to this guy. He's going to be doing it right. So we're so grateful for Wendy for having done that and for having helped us out in some other ways as well. Um, but by that point, we said, you know, we need to do this and we just have to move forward, not only because... Personally, I'd already invested so much time and energy into this. I'd read all these books and watched all these documentaries and so forth. But also, you know, not to get too morbid again, you know, we were concerned about people that maybe wouldn't be around that much longer. Sure. And not to put too fine a point on it, one of our interviewees who everyone had just said across the board, please make sure to get him in this because he's always left out of things like this and he's not going to be around much longer. Gene Henderson, who did indeed past during the time of this project and actually told us during the interview he probably wouldn't be around when it launched and indeed that was sadly true he'd been in and out of hospitals and his wife mary henderson had also already passed so we didn't have an opportunity to speak with her um, but we're really proud of the fact that we got gene in there we got people talking about gene and mary and you know there's a great quote from i believe it's barry short who outright says you know he and mary were what were two of the unsung heroes of Comic-Con for having brought in a lot of people. They worked security and they did all these other things and they sort of brought in almost in a way it sounded like kind of interns. People would sort of come in through Gene and Mary and then they would stick around and start getting more involved. So we were really proud that we could do that along with a few other people who, you know, the reality is just they might not be around that much longer. And it was so important for us to get this, especially when we were learning you know, again, I hate to say it, but COVID obviously affects people who are older more. So it just, it really became very important for us to get this done, to do it right. And we just said, we, we have to move forward and make it happen, however it happens. And as you said, John, I personally, I watch every documentary that ever comes out. I read every autobiography. I read every biography. I mean, it's just what I do. And I do get frustrated when it becomes more about the person who's writing the book or the person who's made the documentary or when they talk to four people and then they talk to a bunch of fans or they talk to someone who, you know, has a Twitter page about the subject. It's like, that's fun and everything, but I want the people who were there. I want the real information. I want the Roger Friedman's and the Brink Stevens and the Barry Alfonso's and the Mike Towery's, you know, it's, you know, it's great to sneak in a few Kevin Smith's and so forth in there too. Got to have that also, but sure. I got to get, you know, these other folks in there. And that was really, really important for us, especially something as important as Comic-Con and that has been written about and talked about so many times before, you know, without anyone saying, let's get everyone to talk about this and let's bring it all together. And we're really proud that we were able to do it in a way that I think, you know, we're, we're, everyone was happy about. Now it is Rashomon-esque and we do sure. We sure have had people say, we didn't call ourselves nerds and geeks. And we had people say, we, we weren't into to the, the politics of the sixties and the this and the that. And I keep saying, you know what? You might be weren't, but clearly these seven other people were because that's not me talking. That's them talking, you know? Amen. So Absolutely. We really, 
you know, we wanted to have all of those contradictions. We wanted to have sure. them have their say. And that was really important for us and how we were always pitching it even to our interviewees. We said, look, this is going to be Rashomon. You know, we really wanted that to be a part of this. And I think that's the magic of an oral history. And that's going all the way back to Alan Lomax and Studs Terkel and the original oral history books about Edie Sedgwick and Truman Capote and everything else that have been done over the years. And that's where I'm coming from. Please kill me. The punk oral history, which is so fantastic that Legs McNeil did. And I think it's like a gold standard. You know, there are people who disagree, but that's you got to have that. You got to have those disagreements because that's what makes it a history. Absolutely. I, I had the pleasure of interviewing Studs Terkel in my radio mm -hmm. career a couple of times and know exactly what you're talking about. Roger, can I trouble you? Because it's one of my favorite little asides sure. in uh, in the documentary. Do you mind telling, um, first of all, and I want you to give the name of your house band that kind of became the house band for the costume uh, celebrations. But it's funny, um, there's a Jim Shooter, Vinnie Coletta story that I just <laughs> cracked up about. Please tell it if you don't exactly. mind. Exactly. Yeah, so, so my... The entirety of my musical careers is the leader of a band that we called uh, Dr. Raul Duke and his All Human Orchestra. And of course, the name Raul Duke was stolen un unapologetically from, from Hunter Thompson because that was the nom de plume under which he originally published Fear and Loving in Las Vegas in <laughs> Rolling Stone back in the day. Um, but we would perform only at Comic Con, uh, sort of one, once a year, and that was it. And one of the songs that we did was, um, um, was that actually, a, it was a, uh, parody of the kinks you really got me uh which became this art really stinks um and, and one of the lines in there like uh uh was actually uh, commenting on vince coletta's um ham-handed i think uh, inking of, of curvy and all that I mean, and of course all of this was done in fun sure uh, and everybody laughed so it's all good um and and, and shortly thereafter we're, we're backstage and the, this a gigantic person in a business suit comes backstage, which turns out to be Jim Shooter, and reads us the riot act about, you know, that uh, <clears throat> Vince Collette is there in the audience, one of the greatest guys in the industry. You just tore him down and so on. They sort of looked at each other and went, oh, that was, that was amusing. But That's yeah, awesome. So, yeah, yeah. But uh, no, but we, we definitely had a lot of fun with all that. And the... Um, and, and of course, other bands came in in later years, and, and frankly, did a much better job than we were. But but <laughs> but but, but, uh, but we were the the OG uh, mu uh, musical entertainment uh, at Masquerade at Comic Con for many years. That's wonderful, man. That's outstanding. The other thing is, and I love the comparison from uh, recent history to back in the day uh, when you listen to the early episodes. <laughs> And I, I'm, not, I'm a massive Star Trek fan, and I'm not apologizing at all. But I loved that their invasion of early Comic-Con back in the early 70s was kind of seen as a, what are these guys doing at our party? And, and certainly, immediately, I thought of uh, the same reaction to the Twilight people. And sure enough, as you listen to the series, that's well documented as well. So... How did you feel, Roger, about uh, about the Star Trek, uh, the Trekkies, the uh, Trekkers <laughs> invading? Yeah, and, and actually that was before the word Trekker showed up. So at that point, they were unapologetically Trekkies. There's no question about it. Um, <laughs> and what, you know, and obviously we had all really enjoyed Star Trek the first two seasons more so than the third, I might add. Sure, sure. Um, but, uh, and, and some of us were out watching the animated series as well, because that was happening later on. Right, absolutely, but, yeah. yeah. But uh, but I, I certainly did find at the time that the uh, the Star Trek folks, who who almost um, to a person showed up in in uniform for these events, um, at least in my experience, they didn't integrate very well with, with the rest of the crowd. They were they were sort of a uh, a pod under themselves, if you will. And they're having their own shore leave before there was the shore leave mm -hmm. conventions uh, all on their own. And so um, there was actually Mark Evanier was behind a, uh, a series of buttons. And I still have my little pin, uh, pin back buttons that said stamp out Star Trek. <laughs> and I, I still have mine, but, and it was all, it was all sort of um, t tongue in cheek, but, uh, but we, we did sort of, you know, to be honest, a lot of us had the attitude that, you know, they, these, these Star Trek fans are taking it a little bit too seriously. And in fact, the very first performance of the All Human Orchestra was based on that. We said, you know, our, our notion was, well, you know, 
yeah, you guys are upset about this TV show that was on for three seasons. It's canceled. You wish it was come back. But there was another TV show that was on for many years. It was actually on for even longer than Star Trek, based on one of the great fantasy themes, the theme of the shipwreck survivors. And so, so we, we started Gilligan's Island fandom. <laughs> and, and rather than being uh, uh, calling each other's Trekkies and saying live long and prosper, our, we were the Gillies, and our greeting was, hey, well, buddy, sure. um, as, 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 the, as, as the captain would always greet Gilligan on the, on the show. And, uh, and we did a performance of the Gilligan's Island theme song on stage that, to riotous applause. Um, and so, so that, was, that was sort of our response at the time to the Trekkie. The, the, the word Trekker came a lot later. We said, oh, no, no, we're, we're, we're much more civilized than that. But... Um, but at the, uh, at the time, the Trekkies, yeah, we, we liked them all individually, but it was a, uh, uh, but it did feel like it was sort of a different and almost non-contiguous subset of what was going on with, with Comic-Con. It's interesting to learn, uh, too, prior to the San Diego Convention Center being used, the original El Capitan. And oh, El Cortez. The, oh, pardon me. Pardon me. Thank you. El Cortez. You see, again. <laughs> one, of, one of the newer generation getting it wrong. I appreciate that. That's fantastic. The El Cortez and also um, the U.S. Grant uh, Hotel? Yeah, originally the U.S. Grant and then the El Cortez and then uh, later on the, the old uh, San Diego Civic Center, uh, uh, Convention Center, which, which was uh, closer to downtown and then eventually moved over to the, the brand new Convention Center uh, where, where it's been for a number of years now. And it was uh, it's funny because friends of mine, when, when they attend – comic-con will stay at the u.s grant and i know conan o'brien uh was was shooting uh if not if they weren't shooting the show there i know they were staying there because uh a friend of mine only was able to get a one-day badge in recent years but it very smartly and as i as i told him as well i'm like hey good news i know they have one badge one day badge at the convention center i'm like there's so much go i mean comic-con takes over the entire town when it's especially the downtown and the gas lamp uh, district yes. And um, I'm like, so don't feel bad. You're going to have a blast no matter what. And he went to two of the Conan O'Brien tapings and stuff. But again, going back to the beginning, and I love how you guys describe it in the doc, that this was not the best neighborhood uh, back when you guys are having the con. And I can only imagine children telling their parents, oh, yeah, we're going to the U.S. Grand Hotel. And, and the horrified looks of, as I mean, you'll describe it better, Roger, because you were there. I mean, you know. Yeah. Yeah, certainly at that time, uh, downtown San Diego was a little less gentrified than it was today. Uh, there, there was certainly, um, a, 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 at the time, one of the radio stations in San Diego had a contest to, to write songs about San Diego. And a good friend of mine, Jan Tonneson, who, who was a dealer back in the early days at Comic-Con as well for, okay. uh, for his bookstore. But he wrote a song about uh, with lyrics about... Uh, uh, the, the, the downtown streets of San Diego aren't places where you stay unless you want to find your heart floating in the bay. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so some was a, was a little rough. You know, if you stayed inside the hotel as we did, it's fine. It's just sort of the, the transit from the parking area to, um, to where you're going to be. But um, it, it's certainly not as bad as some cities, but it's certainly nowhere near as, uh, as neat and tidy as a lot of downtown San Diego is today. That's right. Uh, Ed Anderson from the audience uh, points out there actually ended up being a Star Trek themed uh, TV commercial for the con that aired locally. Do you guys remember that? When did that happen? I must confess, I don't remember that one. Okay, no problem. Um, what dropped my mouse? There's part out there it. somewhere. No, that's cool. And again, a, incredible, Matthew. The the amount of archive audio that you guys were able to collect and you hear. Jack Kirby speaking at the convention, Stan Lee and, and Ray Bradbury speaking at the convention. Those are the obvious names. Um, also mentioning the, uh, staying on the Star Trek theme for a moment. I love the story. And I, and forgive me, you guys fill in the blank. Whoever the science fiction writer was that was complaining about the Star Trek fans being there and the great Bijou uh, Trimble uh, standing up and saying, hey, you guys were complaining that we don't have enough women at these things. We're here because of Star Trek. Please tell, I mean, shame on me for telling part of the story. But, yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, we, uh, we because of the, the Star Trek fandom and we thought it was such a great case study for how fans get together and organize and unite, 
um, because as you probably know, John, um, and I guess spoiler alert, but oh well, we really tell the full story of how people like B. Joe and uh, John Trimble came together with a lot of other fans to literally save Star Trek and to bring it back after it was canceled after season two and were able pre-internet, pre any of that stuff, no cell phones or anything. They were able to get, I think it was something like 25,000 fans to one person says a million in our series, but I, I, I'm going to believe the 25,000 a little bit more. I agree with you. Incredible. Yeah. To, they were able to get a petition together to bring it back. And indeed NBC agreed to do it. And, and a number of people we spoke to and a few of them say it in the series, think that's probably the first time fans organized in such a way to bring back a TV show. Now, of course, that happened. That kind of stuff happens all the time, Veronica Absolutely. Mars, whatever. But that was probably the first time that that happened. And we did speak with both B. Joe and John, two other people that were so glad we were able to really integrate into the series, make it clear how important they were not only to the con, but to fandom and certainly to the Star Trek community. I mean, they 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 should be particularly B. Joe should be on the Mount Rushmore of Star Trek fandom because she was there in the very beginning. And as you just said, John, you know, from the story that was told, um, I think it was either Maggie Thompson or maybe Jeannie Peacock or, or, or one of the others, but tells the story of being there when there were two science fiction shows that were being shown, actually. It was a Time Tunnel and it was Star Trek. And when everyone saw Star Trek, yeah, people were delighted, but there were a lot of people who were complaining, oh, this is not hard science fiction. This is not real science fiction. And that's when uh, evidently B. Joe stood up and said what you just said, John. And we we have a little bit of that in the series. We had a little bit more of that from the interviews about how Star Trek really did help to widen things a little bit more for the gender parity as far as bringing in more women to fandom because you saw so many women in Star Trek. And a lot of people might not know this or have forgotten, but there were also a lot of women behind the scenes of Star Trek writing for it, uh, Dorothy and, and various others who were very involved. And so, of course, we're all familiar about how Star Trek was opening things up on a racial level, but it's also interesting to remember, especially for my generation, that you didn't see a lot of women in this the science fiction realm. And so suddenly Star Trek had that. And these are women with authority, women with power, women who were villains. And again, even in real life, women behind the cameras, writing the shows, working on the shows and so forth. So for B. Joe to stand up and do that, I think was really important. Um, and we were really happy to kind of be able to put her on a pedestal in our series and be able to talk about her throughout and have her interview throughout the entire series as well because of how important she was. Completely agree. And again, great comparison to the uh, Star Trek uh, reaction as well as the Twilight reaction you know, uh, 30 years later or 40, uh, 35 years later, I suppose. I, I was told there'd be no math today. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, you know, and again, I remember all the Twilight reaction. And, um, yeah, it was, you know, a good friend of mine even was covering the convention for uh, Newsarama at the time mm -hmm. and really was camping out with the Twilight people waiting for uh, the ability to get into Hall H. And you really, in that final episode, really explain – the modern Comic-Con. I Honestly, for people who've even never experienced San Diego Comic-Con, uh, as someone who has many times in recent years, you get a great sense of what it's like now. Yeah. And the, the, uh, the creation of Hall H, where all the big film and television announcements happen. 5,000 people sitting down. Can't wait to hear Chris Evans and Robert Downey and Scarlett Johansson, uh, you know, uh, show up. It's a big woo fest where everyone's screaming. I mean, they could just say uh, they could read from the phone book and people are going to be screaming because they're just so excited to see them live. And just the fact, too, that people do camp out for specific um, panels. And unfortunately, that kind of shuts some people out for other Hall H programming. And I remember that frustration back in the Twilight years. And as someone, again, armchair quarterbacking, I'm like, well, why don't they put Twilight first in the day? <laughs> when they see all this happening, kind of switch the arrangement around. And obviously that's probably unlikely given the amount of TV and film people and their own schedules and their willingness to show up. I know the, the agents of shield when they showed up, I heard great stories about the, the bus ride from uh, LA to San Diego to do their day mm. uh, back when the show was brand new and just some of the nightmares that they went through. And then again, I think you illustrate that in a very uh, clear way in the, in the documentary, I've got the link real fast. I want to um, let everyone know that it's sitting right now in the chat on all the platforms that we're broadcasting live from. And uh, also it will be 
in the uh, description on the audio when uh, when I release this conversation as an audio as well. But yeah, it's uh, it's weird. And uh, you know, yeah, Roger. I mean, were you there for any of the Twilight nonsense and stuff? That was around uh, 08 and 09. I know. Yeah, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I was there in both 09 and, and 2010. And yes, that that was the first year that, in fact, I saw the the line for Hall H snaking its way around like some. Um, some demented worm Ouroboros eating its own tail in some sense. Um, but, but to be honest, I, I never really saw those people uh, integrated into the rest of the Comic-Con crowd. Uh, they were sort of off, you know, in, in their line for Hall H. Uh, although I, I did see people, compl- I do remember distinctly that year, people complaining that, you know, you know Comic-Con is too big. Where, where's the comic book stuff? And I said, oh, oh the original Comic-Con is still here. There's just 50 of them happening simultaneously in the same building. A hundred percent, man. And I would say the same thing because I would uh, hear on podcasts and read uh, that classic Comic-Con isn't for comic book fans anymore. And I would read from the program the hours of each day that there were comic specific panels going on. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, it's not going to be on the front page of USA Today or CNN or any of the big websites because they're going to cover the Hollywood side of it. Of course they are. But meanwhile, I would talk about things like, thankfully, before he passed away, I saw Arnold Drake interview Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. Hmm. And I saw Mark Wade interview Russ Heath. And, and you know, things like that. Uh, you know, uh, and again, even my own panels that I was able to do. Mike Norton was the guy I couldn't think of from Chicago. That when he, the year he won the Ink Pot Award. Uh, he's like, hey, do you mind uh, doing my panel? I'm like, are you kidding? That's great. I had one year, it was um, 2010, where uh, the Immamans, John Hickman, and Bendis are all like, if you're going to Comic-Con, can you do our panels? And I'm like, I guess I'm going to Comic-Con. And so, so I really, on a shoestring, got got the flight, was staying in, um, uh, is it uh, not Chula Vista, whatever, whatever the town is right before you get to uh, San Diego proper. So um, Chula Vista is it might have been Chula Vista. or La Mesa or one of those. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was uh, La Mesa or whatever, okay. but it was, yeah. I mean, and, 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 you know, again, I can only think in Chicago terms, but like being in the Northern suburb of Chicago and getting on the expressway yes. and, and commuting every day to San Diego so that I could do it and like staying, staying at, like in a, Rockford or something. Yeah. Yeah. And staying <laughs> at like a, a, a really gross, you know, kind of, it wasn't motel six in case they ever want to sponsor word balloon, but it was like kind of one of those, like, you know, uh, really gross places that I pretty much kept my sweats on. And if I could have worn mittens, mm-hmm. I would have in terms of the grossness of the room. But I'm like, all right, I'm just sleeping here. I'll do my panels and then I'll get the hell out of here and go back to Chicago. But I'm glad I did it because it really was still amazing. And and it truly, I mean, the great thing is, and this is the other thing you get from uh, the history of San Diego, uh, the amount of breaks career-wise that a lot of fans got because they went there and made the right connections. And Matthew, you can speak to that in terms of the, I'm sure the amount of stories you got in terms of people like that, and maybe even name drop some of these people. Definitely. Um, You know, I'm not going to call it a regret because there's nothing to regret. It's just the nature of the beast. We, you know, in speaking with 50 people, plus all the archival material and such we had, we probably had 70 hours of original interviews. Wow. Most of the people I spoke to, we spoke to, for an hour and a half, two hours, some of them three hours long. Some people we, we spoke to multiple times. Um, and then, of course, yeah, we had all this great material, archival stuff from uh, Mike Towery and Alan Light. And as I said, SCSU and all these other places. So we had a ton of material to wade through and to uh, curate and figure out what we wanted and what we wanted to do with it all. Um, and we knew from the get go, because I had an outline from the very beginning that it was going to be a six part series and that each episode would probably be around an hour. At one point, we were re- really noodling around with the idea of maybe making it more like an hour and a half or even two hours because we knew we had so much great material. But we were just worried that we would end up out saying our welcome. And we thought, you know, maybe we could take some of this extra material and do some other stuff with it later. I hope so. Not supposed to really say anything, but let's just say there's more to come. Um, but Great the- to hear. Go on. <laughs> yeah. I didn't hear a thing. Go yeah. On. But uh, um, the point, anyone who got this far in the in the in, in this interview, they deserve to know. Yeah, there'll, there'll be some more stuff coming down the road here. But the point of all of that is that we did have a lot about different individual people whose careers really were changed um, very directly by Comic-Con. And 
Um, one thing that I am happy about is though we weren't able to get all those stories in because we had so much material, we were able to focus on one really good case study. I think that was a lot of fun, which is in the sixth episode where we have Stan Sakai, the creator of Usagi Ojimbo, and Kevin Eastman, co-creator of Teenage Ninja, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um, I know Kevin's reputation is a little spotted in the industry, so just starting with that, aware of that. But um, point is, we have we we interviewed them both separately. But there was one story that we realized really tells that tale of how people coming to Comic-Con could kind of help each other out and get their career going. And we basically cut their interviews together at one point in such a way that you're hearing Kevin and Stan talking about, you know, when we went to Comic-Con, we were the funny animal guys. And for whatever reason, they put us by the bathroom. And so we would kind of laugh about that. And then when Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles started blowing up in the mid 80s, you know, Kevin and Peter, the other creator of Teaching Peter, Peter, Laird. Peter Laird, was able to talk with Stan and say, hey, you know, do you want Usagi in, you know, the cartoon? Do you want Usagi as a, as a toy? Do you want Usagi this, that, and the other? And they were basically helping Stan and his creation, Usagi Ojimbo, to come up and to transcend and to become more in the mainstream as the Turtles were. And both of them make it clear that happened because of their relationship at, at, at Comic-Con. And Stan even says at a point, Stan Sakai says, you know, we made the deals at, at Comic-Con and we were signing the papers at Comic-Con. And for anyone who doesn't know, now Stan is moving on 35 years later to it's going to be apparently a, a Netflix animated series. I know that that's been announced. So I'm not giving anything away. But I'm sure Stan would say, and he kind of implied this, that that was because of the help he got from Kevin and Peter. And that was because of Comic-Con, period. And, you know, we had a lot of stories like that, but we thought that was a really fun one to kind of get into very specifically. Um, and, you know, those were the kinds of things that were certainly happening. And, and a lot of the even kind of foundational guys, um, like Scott Shaw, um, yes. in some ways, Sergio Aragones, who obviously was a legend by the time he even came to Comic-Con anyway. But he really talks about how going really helped him to get out there more, especially when the comic became more international. And he was being invited to India and to Morocco and to England, all these places because of the con and meeting people and giving out awards and getting awards and all of that. It becomes this quorum of all these different people from all over the state, all over the country, eventually all over the world. And they're connecting in ways that they maybe wouldn't have otherwise. And that it, even now, I would say, obviously, the last two years a little different with, with COVID and whatnot, but even in the last few years, I would say, and I've experienced this with other things, um, you just can't have that same kind of connection online. You can't do it over Zoom. You can't do it with some of those other things like this. You know, it's great that we have this technology, but at the end of the day, you got to be there. You got to meet with each other. And let's just be honest, you got to get drunk together. You got to go to the parties together. You got to get in a little trouble together. You got to, you know, if something happens at 3.30 in the morning, behind the scenes, even at Sundance or Coachella or Tribeca Film Festival or Cannes, that's where the magic happens. And, yes. you know, it, it's just not the same thing as having a meeting on Zoom. And so that's one of the things we really wanted to tell the story of over the years at Comic-Con and whether it was helping out people like Scott Shaw or a little later people like Stan or some of the others who came through. We have Felicia Day, of course, who I'm sure a lot of people listening know who that is. She talks about the same thing of going to the con and kind of building her brand and building her, her you know, geek and sundry and, and some of the early things. And the Guild. Yeah, yeah. Her, TV, her TV show, show The Guild. Too. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, the Guild almost kind of became part of Comic-Con as she was continuing to shoot that and so forth. And that doesn't happen without Comic-Con. you got to have that in-person experience, that community experience of touching and hugging and kissing and fighting and throwing and drinking. And it's just a different thing than, than Zoom. And so I think that's really important. Something we really wanted to be clear about and why it's so important that whatever happens with all this COVID stuff and whatnot, hopefully Comic-Con can continue Hopefully these other conventions can continue seeing a movie in a movie theater. I've been telling everyone I know, see a net in the movie theater. You can't see it at home. Everyone needs to be safe and comfortable. I get it. And everyone's got different things. But if you can see a net in the movie theater, it's just a different experience. You can't. I mean, I just think that a movie like a net that is so visually amazing and the music and the immersion aspect of it, you have to see a net in the movie theater. If you can see it in the movie theater. And I mean that right now, um, you know, again, Take care of yourself, comfort level, et cetera. But if you can see it in the theater, see it in the theater, it's just not the same thing as seeing it home with maybe one or two friends or alone on a nice big screen TV. You're not going to get the same experience. Once there's a handle on on uh, COVID and its various uh, you know variants that we're, we're experiencing right now, 
I do believe the live experience will come back. Uh, we know Comic Con. Uh, well, actually, I don't know. Uh, maybe you guys do. They're trying but, for November. They're trying. That's for yeah. I was going to say yeah, Thanksgiving weekend. Yeah, yeah and uh, you know, well, and again, hey, uh, three weeks ago I was in Connecticut for Terrificon at Mohegan Sun. I'm glad I went. I won't deny there was a little trepidation on my part sure. uh, going, but I'm still glad that I went. Uh, I'm eyeballing Baltimore and not sure, you know, I mean, again, they're incredible. And I was a, a judge for the Ringos, not the Eisners, but at least a Ringo judge. So there is part of me that really does want to be there. And then they've been incredibly kind and like, you know, we want you. And I'm like, well, that's good because I'd like to go. But yeah, man, I mean, eventually, eventually we'll, we'll get there again. Are you guys going to be able to go in November? What are you, what are your thoughts? I've, I've been invited to a couple of panels um, that are coming together now, but it's two months out, three months out, and there's not been any real official announcements and there are people concerned. I certainly don't want to step on any toes and, and speak for, you know, David Glanzer or any of the other folks. Certainly, over there right the now organizer. Place, yeah. But, um, you know, I, I know that there's panels coming together. Whether or not it's going to happen or not, I think it's still up in the air. I'll say it like this. I haven't bought my plane tickets yet. I know a few other people who have not. Um, but, you know, there are things coming together. Uh, there are people reaching out. Um, I will say this, too. I think it's it's an important part of the story is this. And, again, you know, not going to confirm nor deny, but there's certainly other things coming along the way with what the work we've been doing and are doing. And I think that it's an important part of the story now, actually, especially because – we were interviewing and talking with people like Roger while this was all happening. And a lot of people talked about what it was like to not be able to go to Comic-Con. And I mean, I was doing interviews with Dave Scroge, who was literally in isolation in his house in Scotland. I mean, they were really locked down. They were not allowed to leave their houses except for, I think, once every two weeks to go grocery shopping, right? Wow. He was in their country. And he and a number of other people, I could see, because a lot of the, the interviews were done over Zoom, I could see it in their eyes. It really hurt them that they couldn't go. Cause this is not only, especially for people like Roger and Dave and others, this is where they saw their old friends. This is their high school reunion for them. This was their college reunion for them more than just this fun event that they really loved. It was where they saw their old friends, especially like, you know, people are, are not around as much any, you know, people aren't, there's not going to be as many people around. So this might be some of the last time to do that. So I, I want to be able to, in any kind of future ancillary projects we do with this material, be able to talk about that. And one other person that I really need to point out and thank for a lot of stuff that we got was Dr. Erin Hanna, a young woman at the University of Oregon who wrote a fantastic book I recommend to everybody called Only at Comic-Con. It just came out last year. She spent 10 years going to the Comic-Con every year doing in-person research and talking with people and waiting in the lines for the six and seven hours and seeing Robert Downey Jr. Uh, coming into the hall as Tony Stark. You hear that story in, in our podcast. She's the one who really... I knew a little bit about the Twilight thing, but she really gets into it in her book and talked about it during her interview. And I said, wow, this really is more important than you'd think it would be Twilight. Who give, you know, but like, wow, we really need to talk about it. When I spoke with some other people, they were like, oh yeah, that was a big deal. And so Dr. Erin Hanna did such a fantastic job. But one of the things she talked about that we weren't able to fit into the series, but hopefully for future stuff is, you know, her disappointment that more entities weren't getting involved with Comic-Con at home and were kind of using it as an opportunity to do their own things, which is understandable. It's the nature of business. But Aaron really made it clear, like, you know, Comic-Con was there for so many of these other companies when they were first getting started and helping them to promote and push their products and so forth, that it was hard to see that they weren't kind of backing up Comic-Con at home and coming and doing stuff with them, you know, to keep it going. And that she was very disappointed in that. I know a few other people were as well. I don't want to point any fingers, but, you know, it is a shame that the Comic-Con at home wasn't supported as much by some of the people in the industry who had always gotten support back from Comic-Con. And hopefully we will see that with some of these other virtual things. And certainly when Comic-Con comes back, and so these are the kinds of stories and ideas and things that, you know, if we do any future projects, um, we can, uh, you know, we can talk about because it was an important part of the story. Now, it's been two years of Comic-Con not happening in real life and how this has affected people like Roger and Dave Scroge and and others who you know didn't get to go. I mean, Scott Shaw needs to go to sell things. I mean, it's a part of his economic, you know, life, you know, or Kevin Smith even and certain other people like that's part of their 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 career they need to go and so we want to be able to talk about that 
if and when you know there's other things it's part of the comic-con story now it's part of the geek culture story now of the community of how covid for two years has affected the community so we'll need to talk about that too any thoughts on that roger uh, I, I would certainly agree. I, it, it is important to bring this stuff back live because as good as any of the online stuff is, um, and certainly Comic-Con at home has done, done a superb job on that, uh, it, there, there's simply no comparison. No. Yeah, certain, certainly, you know, my, my recent experience as, as a college professor, you know, there, there's simply no comparison between in-person teaching, particularly when you try to have students work in groups, which I do, yeah, and trying to do that online, it's like, it, 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 it's, it's like you're on a different planet and not a very hospitable one either. So, so I'm really hoping for things to come back. If, if I may real quick, John, both a personal experience, but also one that, that happened with the Comic-Con people and that's in our series that I really love this, this section on it. And John, I'm sure you'll remember this. And Roger, you were probably there when it happened. But um, I uh, always love the film City Lights. It's one of my favorite movies of all time. It's definitely my favorite Charlie Chaplin film. I'd seen it a million times. I'd researched it. I'd read about it and all the interviews. I, I know City Lights backwards and forwards. Never had seen it in the theater. Had an opportunity to see it in the theater a few years ago at a little uh, theater in Iowa City. There was only 75 seats, but it was packed. And I, I'm getting chills thinking about it. The experience of seeing City Lights, a movie I knew backwards and forwards and seen 100 times before and knew everything about everything about it with a packed audience who were crying together, who were laughing together, I, it was, it was, I'm feeling it right now. I mean, just those, that, the, the energy in the air. And I really remember sitting there going, this is the power of seeing a movie in the theater with other people, even with a movie that I loved and already knew so much. And, and Roger, you might know where I'm going with this, but in our series, we have a few people talking about, you know, the movie Beyond the Valley of the Dolls is a pretty kind of ridiculous, <laughs> silly, kind of boring, whatever. Russ movie. Meyer, but, Roger yeah. Ebert uh, <laughs> joint. Yes. Roger yes. Ebert, yeah. And, but you see it, and we have this in our series where a few people talk about it because everyone remembers when you guys showed Beyond the Valley of the Dolls at Comic Con that year. And, you know, just it was such a better experience. You know, all I can say, this is maybe the better analogy, they're seeing Rocky Horror Picture Show at home. <clears throat> and then they're seeing Rocky Horror Picture Show at a midnight movie at the New Art in LA or whatever. People are throwing things at the screen and they're dressing up and they're making out with each other and whatever else. I mean, it's just, it's two different experiences, period. Well, and you, know? you guys illustrated with, and I'm sorry, Roger, because I do want to hear what you think, but you guys illustrated it with J.J. Abrams in recent years when uh, when he was, it, I guess it was Force Awakens that, um, you know, he did his big presentation and also had the live uh, orchestra uh, did he have the live orchestra doing the the score? And if not, he showed scenes with uh, the the music, regardless. And I know it cleared Hall H, where it's like he did his presentation at Hall H, and he's like, "If you will, you could come with me." And I believe I'm reasonably certain there was a live orchestra that you could see footage and everything. And it's pretty funny. I, I don't think you covered this part of it, but I know Kevin Smith had the panel afterwards, and everybody got up, and Hall H was almost empty. Because all these people are like, I want to see this Star Wars exclusive thing and see it in this live experience. So no. And also what you get said about reunions and stuff, I always refer to San Diego as very expensive summer camp. Yeah. Because I see all my out-of-town friends and it's like, hey, we're having a blast. And yeah, this is costing me a couple grand to be here for five days. But I don't care. I'm having a blast. And it's so good to see everybody. And also I'm, I'm working and getting good networking happening for my podcast. So... But yeah, please, Roger, if you would, about uh, just the live experience and stuff. And again, someone who's literally experienced it when it was just your high school buddies getting together to do something to where we are now. Sure. No, there's no question that, as I say, the in-person experience is so much dramatically better. You're, you know, when we were talking uh, before the broadcast about the fact that when you were there the, the first time you were, that you could just walk up to, for instance, Samuel L. Jackson and just talk to him. And certainly going back to the uh, the early 70s when, you know, Jack Kirby was sitting out there by the by the swimming pool and you just go up and talk to Jack and, <clears throat> you know, have, have, have a, ch a chat with Don Rico about what happened and what actually happened in the Golden Age. Uh, Ray Bradbury was there and so on. So the fact that it was so small and, and intimate <clears throat> and the fact that you could do that in person, you know, what was really one of the, uh, for me, one of the highlights of the early Comic-Con experience. Some of that, unfortunately, is, of course, lost. Uh, with what's happening today, but um, but there's certainly place where you can you can meet with who the greats are going to be 20 years from now, because they're at Comic Con, and you'll find them in Artist Alley, and you just go up and talk to them. 
And Artist Alley is, in, in fact, at Comic-Con, I think is one of the, for many people, the great undiscovered treasures, simply because there are so many amazing artists there. And you can just go up and talk to them. So, Absolutely. so the people that say, oh, there's no comic books at Comic-Con anymore said, yeah, if you just had Artist Alley and that was it, you know, then that would be worth the price of admission in and of itself. The academic uh, side of Comic-Con always inspires me as well. And my buddy, Rob Salkowitz, who's a wonderful uh, observer of uh, what's going on oh, in, in the nerd circles and stuff. He's the guy who kind of hit me to that in my last few years of going. And he's like, you got to go, man. And it's so funny because literally there'll only be maybe 10 people in the audience, but I'm learning so much about aspects of comics I had never thought of before. And I remember one year in particular, uh, they focused on a comic strip that was appearing in Japanese newspapers in the post-World War II era in an attempt to renormalize relations between Japan and America after Japan had been conquered. And, and this just this interesting exploration of this one particular comic strip. And, you know, here's a facet of comics I had never thought of or heard of. And thank God there are academics out there that are really, again, filling in these gaps of the 20th century and getting the story straight in terms of uh, what happened and what we might have missed when all we're thinking about is what, you know, DC, Marvel, and as you said, Roger Charlton even uh, putting out. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that Charlton documentary that's in the works. I don't know <laughs> if you guys are aware of it as well. But, I'm uh, surprised yeah, the... The East Coast guys, a couple of guys, I think they're from Derby, Connecticut, where Charlton was, uh, you know, printed and everything. No, that's that's going to happen. So that'll fill in some great historic gaps. So, yeah. Um, no, really, guys, again, unbelievable show. It is uh, six parts long. Uh, it is such a great pleasure to listen to. And um, I, I appreciate the rumors that we're hearing that maybe it's not the last we'll hear of, of the content. That yeah, Matthew we'll, leave, we'll leave it at that, but yeah, th anyone who's interested, definitely keep keep your eyes on other things that may be coming through this. We have a lot of material, and we have a lot of passion, and uh, we and and I I want to just say it in front of everybody. Uh, we're so happy that people like Roger and some of the others in particular. You know, we we did speak to about fifty people just for time sakes and practicality. You know, can't stay in touch with every single person we talk to, but there are certain folks who continue to send us such nice emails or call us or are sending us material. Brink Stevens uh, just was looking through some old stuff. She actually, Roger, I don't even think you know this, but she found a bunch of old uh, footage she has from old masquerades and things. She had oh, great. A, for a DVD. She sent it over to me. I uh, should be getting it any day now. And just other people who um, are so happy with what we did that they're continuing to send us pictures and artwork and you know we we just are continuing to amass stuff and we want to honor the memories we want to honor the con we want to honor the geek culture and we want to honor people like roger and and scott shaw and some of the others wendy all and everything who have been particularly supportive and that's that's the best response i mean to read gus kruger multiple emails saying you know thank you for you know, giving my dad, you know, this, this place in the history, it brought tears to my eyes. That's when it's really special. And there's no review, you know, Rob Salkowitz gave us a really great review in Forbes and a few other people wrote some really amazing things about it. We're really happy about it and all the nice things you've said, John, but sorry, there's just nothing that compares to Roger or Mike Towery or a few others that have just made it very clear how happy they are with what we did. And we, we, we didn't want to dishonor them. We didn't want to disrespect them. And we also are appreciative, you know, and Roger, I want to say to you here too, you know, that you let us be warts and all. And, you know, we wanted to be, you know, uh, respectful, but we also wanted to make sure people were able to, and as you said, John, and I won't say anything more about it because I think it's a great episode, but episode four was a tough one. We wanted to talk about Shell and we knew some people really liked it and some people really didn't. And we we didn't want to just, you know, keep some people over here and some people over there. We wanted to put it together. And you will hear one person will say he was the best guy in the world. Right afterwards, we'll say he was the worst guy in the world. And we wanted everyone to have their opportunity to speak their truth. And, um, you know, that was really important for us. And to do that through the entire series, even the stuff with Twilight is one of my favorite sections, just because I'm happy of we had people say, Boy, people were angry about Twilight because 
you know, was bringing in more females or younger females or whatever. And that's what it was about. But then we did have other people. In fact, it's Len Wein himself from an old interview of mine from years ago. Obviously, he's passed, but uh, yeah. where he yeah. said he's the one who says, you know what? I get what they're coming from, but it was a little selfish of them to take space in Hall H when these other panels are coming through. And it's like, wow, that's a good point, too. It's like I really wanted to make sure that we were ping ponging the entire time. And so that we weren't inserting ourselves, myself, Chris Tyler, Rob Schulte, and some of the others who worked on this. We, we didn't want this to be our story. We wanted it to be their story. And for anyone who hasn't heard it yet, to be clear too, Brink did a fantastic job as narrator, but we really wanted to make sure it was just, you know, intro, outro to episode, a couple little contextual places. She herself, you hear some of her interview. Obviously she was interviewed in addition to her narration, but yes. 95% of each episode is just straight up excerpts from interviews and archival stuff because we didn't want anyone to, to be forced to feel a certain way. We really wanted the audience to hear it go, hmm, now I'm not sure what I think about this. And then, you know, and to keep learning and to keep expanding, we didn't want them to, to feel like we were trying to say the way certain things were because there is no one story. And, you know, one of the hardest things we had to do was we did have people who said, you know, this happened in 1971 and someone else said this happened in 1974. And there were two really great stories, but it's like, oh, those two stories really like you know, those are two different dates. They don't even work at all. So <laughs> then we had to do a little bit of actual making sure that didn't happen. But we had books and we had documentaries. I will also recommend highly Jackie Estrada's. Um, and I know she worked on with a few other people. She put out a 40th anniversary souvenir book that was my Bible for this in the beginning. And mine's all written up. And she had so much great material just to have someone like Jackie Estrada involved at all. Or obviously, again, others like Mark Evanier. I mean, you know, they, they were really holding up the candle and we bowed down to them and having them Absolutely. involved. You know, I could call them anytime and ask them questions or, again, Mike Towery or Barry Alfonso, Roger, Scott Shaw. I mean, it was everyone was always there for us. When did this happen? Was it 71 or was it 74? You know, was it El Cortez or was it UCSD? And and we would get back responses right away, usually. And everyone was really helpful. We couldn't have done it otherwise. And, you know, so, you know, we were so happy to be able to do that and glad that people are enjoying it. So, yeah, And, well, and I, I, will, I will say that even though I was present at the creation for a lot of this stuff, I learned a tremendous amount from the podcast. Is that I didn't know that that, like, <laughs> that was happening, and why wasn't I invited? It was really quite amazing. <laughs> well, and I, I echo uh, Ed's thoughts, who uh, said, "Yes, I think you guys did succeed in terms of being exactly. very, very uh, even-handed, and and really, in particular, that Sheldorf episode. Um, I had only heard." Uh, very surface things about Shell's involvement in Detroit. And I know now the Detroit Comic-Con has the Shell Awards or the Dorf Awards. I forget what they're called. And uh, it was interesting to hear a much more well-rounded look at uh, Shell Dorf's involvement in Comic-Con and the opinions of those who created it, uh, both positive and negative. No, and again, like you said, uh, Matthew, it's Rashomon. And that's, yeah. uh, and, and that's good because it, there is no one answer. As, as no. they say, there's, you know, one side, another side, and somewhere in the middle lies the truth. Yeah. And, and I think you guys did a great job of, of presenting those facts and letting us judge for ourselves. That was know. really important for us. Especially, you know, look, I think that the, the series is really fun. You know, the music was great. Max DiVincenzo did a fantastic job. A few people, you know, made that very clear. The archival stuff is so much fun. I mean, to hear, you know, Will Eisner, Jack Kirby. Or, I mean, one of my favorite parts is Ray Bradbury at the 70 Con angrily talking about how important Mad Magazine is. I like, was going to bring that up. I'm so glad like, you did. God yes. damn it. Like, Mad Magazine's important. Grr! And like, it's like, oh my God. Like, well, I need to make a time machine and go back and see that happen. <laughs> but, you know, that stuff is so much fun. But we Absolutely. really had a feeling that at the end of the day, this would appeal to a certain group of people who not necessarily just fans or geeks or nerds or people into Comic-Con whatnot, but, you know, a little bit more sophisticated tastes and, and people who would be able to sit there and listen to an hour long podcast about messing around on their phone or watching TV or whatever it is. So we wanted to, we wanted to have expectations of the audience and to believe that they would be aware enough and smart enough to kind of make their own decisions. And even something like the Shell thing, we wanted to have, we always knew we were gonna have episode four, an episode about Shell, but we also, you know, kind of 
teased it through the entire thing so yeah. that even in later episodes you hear a little bit about kind of what happened to Shell later and early on you're you're hearing about Shell but every now and then we kind of wanted to have that little tease in there like wait a second so that when we do get to episode four it's you know Mark Evanier even says it he goes you know can I assume that by this point everyone knows who Shell Dorf is as soon as he said that in his interview I I was like we're that we're going to be probably starting that episode with that because there is almost kind of like okay let's talk about now you've heard a little bit about Shell now we're going to talk about the man and um you know so we we really wanted to make sure that we were considering those threads throughout and i was just lucky that not only do we have such great stories but everyone's such great storytellers you know especially i mean we had a few best-selling authors things and people who tell stories for a living even roger you know writes uh you know physics textbooks and brings in all these creative things in there and and that kind of thing so you know we were just very lucky about the interviews we were getting and also that my team i'll pat myself and myself included we're all professional storytellers we all work in film and television and podcasts and books and such so we were able to really kind of spitball it and say we're going to make something special this is not just going to be a group of fans getting together talking to five or 10 different people, cutting some of that together, put together an hour long thing. Cause it could have been that, that would have been a lot easier, would have been a lot cheaper. It would have been a lot less stressful. Um, but instead we decided to take the hard route and to spend the last year and a half, 10 hour days killing ourselves, making this thing. And thank you, John, for helping to get the word out about it. And all the other people have been so supportive, Rob Salkowitz and people at the San Diego Tribune and the OC register and people all over other podcasts we've been doing. And, Anyone listening to this, we're happy to do more of this. We really want to get the word out. We want to let people know that Comic-Con Begin exists and that, um, you know, it's something that we hope people will hear, not just for the people who made it, but for the people who it's about, like Roger, and then the fans and people who have been there, like John and others, to kind of hear, the, to fill in those gaps, the things they might not have known about or to hear from the people who made it happen, not from us, not from the researchers, but from the Roger Friedmans uh, who were involved in it. No question. Roger, I want to acknowledge uh, your academic background, uh, teaching physics and astronomy at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And as Matthew acknowledges, uh, you've written four widely used uh, physics and astronomy, astronomy textbooks. Uh, and it's cool to see that uh, as I'm reading from your uh, bio on the Comic-Con website that uh, you put in a lot of uh, comic book and nerd references in uh, in your text. I think that's fantastic. It's, uh, yeah, Green Lantern is in there. Bat There's actually one of the problems where Batman is swinging as a pendulum and he collides with the Joker. So you have to use momentum conservation, energy conservation. So yeah. yeah. That's outstanding. Uh, guys, truly, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I'm so glad that uh, Matthew tapped me on the so shoulder about this. I, I didn't know about this. I don't have Sirius and XM. Luckily, everyone listening and watching, you don't need Sirius and XM. It is available now on all podcast platforms. Uh, Matthew pointed me to Spotify. And uh, this is the Spotify link. It is, again, in the chat for the video watchers, and it will be in the description uh, for the audio version of this discussion. But I can't recommend Comic-Con Begins more than uh, as I have gushed in this hour-plus conversation. You really need to hear it. It's great to hear the story. And it's, uh, one as uh, Matthew said, great storytelling. And that is the strength of podcasting. And, uh, I, you know, again, this is, this is why I love the kind of podcasting I do, but I'm a big fan of narrative storytelling and podcasting shows like yours and Katrina Longworth. And you must remember this. And it's great to hear just good narrative. And uh, you only get that in podcasting. So yeah, I, I'm obviously a convert and a believer in mm -hmm. this format, but uh, you guys uh, did a hell of a job. So congratulations on that. I'm more than happy to direct people to Comic-Con Begins, now available all uh, six episodes uh, at a podcast platform near you, iTunes, Spotify, uh, my, you know, various others, you know, so check it out. You know, I'm sure you'll be able to find it if you're looking on your phone or on your laptop. So uh, guys, thanks again. Really great conversation. Thank and, you. uh, and hopefully, uh, if this is only the beginning of other projects, uh, other things that we could talk about in the future as well, please come back both of you because I've been, you know, really, this is a great talk and thank you everybody for watching. Um, taking uh, tomorrow off from War Balloon Live, but uh, we're starting uh, the uh, the Penny Whistle Tour again on Monday with more great programming. I'll talk about it online, but until then, thanks for watching.